So far, we have looked at the history and evolution of networks, especially how the internet changed over time in terms of scale and services. Undeniably, the internet is one of the great technology success stories of the 20th century. It has enabled greater access to information, provided new modes of communication, and has fundamentally changed the way we live, be it to do with the way we work, the way we play, or even the education system itself. But unfortunately, the internet's very success also started creating obstacles to innovation in the networking technology. So let us now start with looking at the original internet design principles and how they have changed over time and the underlying causes for the network ossification. In principle, the internet began as the packet switched networks that wanted to effectively multiplex and utilize the existing interconnected networks. In doing so, the most fundamental or the pivotal principle has been the internet's layering principle. And the emphasis here is on providing the right set of abstractions and modular development of the communication functions, wherein the protocols at each layer addresses specific aspects of the communication function. This allowed the protocol designers to focus on one layer at a time and also provided the means to leverage the services of one layer in building the layers above without adding much of the complexity back into the higher layers. And again, this layering principle also meant to enforce an invariant, that is, the layer N at the destination receives exactly the same copy of the message that was sent by the layer N at the source. And what this meant is that all the headers and other modifications that happen by the below layers or the layers below is independent and doesn't impact when the packet reaches the other end of the layer end. So this provided also the flexibility for incorporating variants of lower layer services that could operate independently. Hence the simplicity and the flexibility that it poses for building independently the layers while trying to build the hierarchy of abstractions resulted in what we see today as our network stack. Another fundamental principle, or rather what began as an argument in the early days in 1984 by Salzer and David Clark's team, resulted in what we see today as an end-to-end -end principle. Uh, to put it in simple terms, end-to-end -end principle meant to vest the responsibility for communication on the end systems and the networks were meant to be just the stateless dumb pipe that carry the contents of the communication. Rightly so, this ensured the simplicity of the network and by simplicity what we mean is the network need not have to bother about much of the service level requirements of the applications but only focus on how to carry the bits and packets and transmit them to the destination end. And this simplicity allows the network to be repurposed and utilized for various services without worrying about the specifics of the services themselves. But what it also argued is to place the service level requirements that needed to be managed and to meet the service level requirements just at the end hosts alone. That is the two end applications that want to communicate take the responsibility of the concerns with respect to the reliability, the latency and communication aspects etc to be just used as they were. And this important principle really led to building the networks to be stateless and ensuring that multitudes of services can be built very easily over the same set of network. And another most important principle that played a very crucial role in the design and implementation of the internet protocols is the robustness protocol or also known as the interoperability principle by John Postel. It's also termed as Postel's law. And what it states is to be conservative in what you send and be liberal in what you expect. And put it in another words, what it's trying to say is when you try to send the messages from your machine to other machines or the applications trying to communicate and trying to deliver messages to the other machines, we should strictly confirm to the protocol specifications 
when we want to send the messages. But when we receive the messages, we should be able to accept the messages even if they are not as conformant to the protocol requirements and treat them in a best effort manner. And at every layer of the protocols, this rule has led to enormous benefits in robustness and interoperability. As a simple example, consider a protocol specification that contains an enumeration of values for a particular header feeds, like you have already seen about the DSCP in the previous lecture, how the code points were defined. And for example, a type field, or it could even be a port number or an error code, etc. And this enumeration that is being defined, we have also seen that they may change over time. Hence, they need to be assumed to be incomplete. That is, if a protocol specification defines four possible values in the current protocol version, it doesn't mean that it has to be strictly just those four variants. And the software should not break if the fifth code shows up. So when we receive, we want to be liberal in trying to accommodate that as much as possible. And another example to put it is like you would have seen the use of reserved field beds in the IP headers, which were meant to be repurposed and used them for later versions of the protocol. And as the team evolution of the protocols happen, you need not worry about the older implementations and misinterpret them either. The new meanings of the old reserved beds can be silently ignored and processed as you go forward. And this is how the robustness principle try to ensure that the things would work as best as possible. A corollary to this is to say that we want to watch out for the misbehaving hosts. The host software should be prepared not just to survive other misbehaving hosts, but also to cooperate and limit the amount of disruptions such hosts can cause to the shared communication facility. Nonetheless, over the recent years, this has been widely debated over its negative consequences and how it could be a bane in the protocol maintenance. And even when protocols extended, it can cause those grave security concerns. And the basic premise of this robustness principle lies in the problem of updating the older software or new features or fixes at the scale of the internet size. That is, if you rethink, given an infinite amount of time, the same protocol may have infinite number of versions that may float around. And if all of these variants of the protocols were to be deployed, now the question of which protocol version should you be really managing? And if not, then an infinite amount of protocols would start to break and not work. Hence, old ways of doing things have to be removed from the protocols and rather the actively maintained ones need to be unified and simplified, which then goes against this robustness principle. right? And also think of it as saying that we want the communication to occur in good faith. And it is like saying that I would not go to any unknown's home and I will make sure and take every caution when I send my packet out, it is going in a right way. But when I say that I would be liberal in trying to accept, it would also try to mean that you would allow everybody or anybody to come to your home. And in fact, this would really dampen the security requirements. Hence, these architectural principles tend to, or rather, are expected to change over time. And when uh, this was rightly put by Carpenter at the Internet Architecture Board, uh, when he defined the architectural principles of the Internet in the early 90s, saying that the principle of constant change is perhaps the only principle of the Internet that would survive indefinitely. And besides, like the, it goes like the RFC 1958 that was put in early uh, 19th, 1990s. This was again updated back within a decade's time and by early 2000, there was a RFC 3439 that tried to put forward several other principles and tried to portray what things have changed in the internet architecture and the key principles. And notably, they tried to put forward the amplification principle wherein it states that there are non-linearities which occur at a large scale and which do not occur at small or medium scale. Put in another terms, in large networks, even small things can result in huge changes or the huge events. Like uh, in a large system as internet, a very small perturbation, like you would have seen many times 
like Facebook was down for almost half a day or Google services went off and they were due to very small perturbations on the BGP rules or the DNS updates that tried to destabilize the entire system. And this is what in internet is called as the amplification principle. And then again, we have the coupling principle, which tries to say that often when you build, have a network stack and when you try to build the protocols, there are more events that simultaneously occur and there is a larger likelihood that two or more will interact. And this phenomena is also termed as an unforeseen feature interaction, but it's very common in the networks to now assume, okay, like when we use the TCP, the underlying layer is IP almost all the cases. And when we are using, talking about security, TLS is almost always the principle that is trying to use TCP as its underlying service to ensure reliable communication. So this kind of a coupling has happened in the network stack. And there again also comes a convergence principle wherein it tries to say that when we have a lot of flexibility in developing a lot of different protocols, it becomes really hard to manage every protocol. And what the community would really converge towards a set or a subset of these protocols. And the end state of this convergence argument is that the concept of everything over some layer wherein you want to build the overlay networks or making the conduit for the network would even converge to a specific set of protocols. And it is important to note that like when we develop the protocols, the operational expenses typically go up in trying to support these protocols at each of the networking devices and hence a convergence will ensue. And this observation is again consistent with the industry experience that happened and why today's routers are now seen to support primarily just the TCP or the UDP and very rarely any other protocols that would allow to pass through at the transport and at the network it's IPv4 and V6 and rest have more or less been done away with. And this point exactly results to what we are going to learn as a part of network ossification. Now, let us try to look into the protocol layering in a bit more detailed way. And as I mentioned, this protocol layering tries to provide the right set of abstractions and build the hierarchy for implementing the communication functions. In doing so, it tries to group a related communication functions and split this communication functions into modules which can be handled or responsibility of each function, some functions of a main communication function can be broken and provided and implemented at different layers. Wherein the expectation at each layer is that it performs a subset of a communication function and in doing so, it relies on the next lower layer to perform specific primitive functions and by the layer itself provides the services to the next higher layer. And at each of these layers, when we say that it provides a service or when it relies on the primitives of the lower layer, we plan to define and implement the protocols for these communications independently at each of the layers, understanding very well the requirements that it would pass on or the services that it would provide to its layer, one layer above. And to look at this simplified diagram on the, the, the slide here, what we are trying to show is that the layer N is going to define the abstractions and the interfaces that would provide the services to the layer N plus 1 and it would basically implement the protocols which would interact with the peers at the layer N on the other end of the system and in doing, implementing this protocol it would also utilize the services of the layer N minus 1. So this provides us with two kinds of communications that we see in this layered architecture. First is the vertical communication, wherein the communication happens between the adjacent layers, layer 7 talking to layer 6, layer 6 talking to layer 5 and likewise. And this requires mutual understanding of the services and the information that they need to provide to each of the layers above and the services from the layers below that the above layer will take use of. And note that this communication happens within a single system. So you will have the protocols like if you are trying to browse on your device, 
HTTP, a typical layer 7 protocol would then interact with the TCP protocol at its layer, lower layer and IP. TCP would interact with the IP and then over Ethernet and then the packets are passed. And likewise, there is also a horizontal communication wherein this kind of a communication is between the software and hardware elements that are running at the same layer but on different machines. That means that this connection is in fact indirect or virtual. And the expectation when a layer N on one device connects to the layer N on the other device is precisely the data that the layer N wants to communicate is exactly what the layer N on the other device would end up receiving. But in doing so, it is going to take and utilize the services of all the lower layers below. So communication cannot happen just at layer N bypassing the layer N-1 that resides below it. And it is the responsibility of the layer N-1 on the other end to pass the information back to the layer N on the receiving side. And this model vests us with very nice principle of what we call and we can partition as what service data needs to be and the flexibility in defining what a protocol data needs to be termed as the SDU and PDU. SDU stands for the service data unit and PDU stands for the protocol data unit. So if we consider at each layer independently the boxes, you receive the data and to that data we add specific metadata based on the requirements of the protocol like if you have seen the TCP has a TCP header, UDP has a UDP header, HTTP adds its own HTTP header. So all of that header and the data put together form what we call as a protocol data unit which distinctly defines what is the information at each layer. So when we speak of the layer TCP segment, we consider the data that is coming from the application layer, be it HTTP, FTP or whatever, and then you add the TCP header to that to create exactly the PDU at the TCP layer which includes the TCP header and the segment of the data that it received from the higher layer. And when this is passed on to the IP layer, the IP layer adds its own header while the protocol hash2 SDU as shown in this figure is basically the ensemble of the TCP header as well as the SDU data that the protocol received. In this way, the communication takes the service data unit, transforms it to a protocol data unit at each layer and when it is communicated to the other end, the other end is sure to be receiving the PDU with the header information which will enable it to parse and process the data that it needs, provide the required services and send it to the layer above. So if we need to look at this in practice and in principle how it has evolved, we need to look at the layer 7, uh, the, the ISO SI model or the layer 5 layered TCP IP ISO TCP IP model and see how this exactly behaves. What we are trying to show is the layered architecture that is in principle the ISO SI7 layer model and the devices, two end devices that are trying to communicate. Let's say you are trying to send an email. The email is the data that you type in that becomes the uh, content or the SDU data to which the layer 7 header, the SMTP as an application protocol that's trying to communicate would add the layer 7 header. And the layer 7 would then take use of the layer below it, that's the layer 6, the presentation, and the layer 6 would take the session layers uh, services, that is 6 to 5, and 5 taking use of the transport layer or the layer 4 services, and likewise. So this, the arrows here represent the vertical communication that happened on the system. And as the entire data reaches or percolates down this vertical stack, you'll see that the headers are being padded for each of the uh, layers. And the data that has been passed and the layer 7 header that has been added continues to percolate all the way down up to layer 1, eventually where the bits are transmitted over the communication channel. And once this data is received at the layer 1, you'll see that the communication precisely is what the layer one on the source end had sent. And once it receives, it would send it up to the data link layer with the exact data of layer two header and layer two uh, 
uh, trailer that is being padded for the specific data. And once test layer 2 receives this particular information, it would strip off the layer 2 headers and trailer information, the frame start and frame end parts, and it would just pass the exact PDU that it would have received from layer 3 back to the layer 3 on the destination end. So the data between layer 3 on the source and layer 3 on the destination would match exactly as they were. And likewise, when the layer 3 sends the data up, it would tag off the layer 3 header and just send the PDU that it would have received from the layer 4 as 6 SDU at layer 3. And likewise, this continues eventually making way for the data to be received by the mail client, which would be able to then render the mail information. And this is exactly what it, the layered principle uh, has its operation in principle. And this, now you can see that the invariance property is met at each of the layers. And at the same time, we can also see that there is a lot of flexibility for the below layers that we can mix and match, wherein it doesn't matter what layer 4 header or layer 5 headers were meant to be, it is only for the, the other side of the layer 5 to take care of, while as the communications happen, as the users decide on the two ends, the information that is being padded and taken off makes no significance for from the user point of view and for each layer point of view any information that is added or padded at, by the below layers makes no significance or doesn't interfere and this is where the flexibility for pro building multiple protocols parallelly for at each of the layers can be achieved and this also ensures now that we can mix and match different protocols at different layers and that's why it highly emphasized on the interoperability and extensibility of different protocols at different layers. Note, however, in practice, we use this TCP IP model. That's basically the five layer model. And it's exactly the same as what we are showing. But there is one catch that I'm trying to present here. Like when we think of the transport layer at the layer four and IP layer, it is not strictly that now the below the IP layer would be the layer two. We are trying to interpose a new layer in between, and this is what exactly happens in the IPsec when we enable the IPsec or the VPN connections that use the IPsec as an intermediate layer. It introduces a new layer in between the layer 3 and layer 2 called the IPsec layer. But note, when we do this, we have actually created a new layer on the vertical stack, and we expect that on the remote side, the same vertical stack exists so that it can process. And in doing so, what we have tried to do is encapsulate the earlier layer 3 in the new layer 3 header that only the IPsec header would understand on the remote side. And now this information is passed on to the layer 2 and layer 2 would consider IPsec as its immediate higher layer or the layer 3 and then process the packet as normal. And eventually when the packet reaches on the other end, the layer 2 now needs to deliver the packet to the IPsec layer, which is the layer above the layer 2 or the layer intermediate between the IP and the layer 2 and then the IP sec would de-encapsulate this packet, process back and send exactly the IP datagram that the IP on the source side would expect the destination to receive. And this way the communication can happen smoothly. And this flexibility is what makes internet to work in heterogeneous networks. The only requirement in such systems is that the layering has to be in sync on the source and destination. And unlike the IPsec as what we are showing here, we could add or intersperse any two layers with any new additions that we can bring in. Like when we think of TLS, now between the upper layer HTTP and TCP is where the TLS layer resides. And we also can think of now saying the entire TCP or UDP packet can be put in an Ethernet frame in a different encapsulation model. So the flexibility this layered architecture provides is to ensure that we can encapsulate any of the layer services as long as we are able to meet the same network stack in terms of the processing of the packet on the other end of the device. But the networks are not just the end hosts. We have a lot more devices operating within the network, like the switches and the routers that I'm showing here. And this hierarchy also 
constraints in the way what should be operated at the switch and the router devices. And interestingly, what we say is the switches need to operate just at layer 2, while the routers would operate at layer 3, that is the network layer. So the flexibility when we think of a point-to-point -point connection that we have with a switch, the information at the data link layer can needs to be understood by the switch, it would process and then forward the packets thereof, modifying whatever at up until the data link layer. And likewise, with respect to the routers, which often now we think of layer 3 routers, but there are also L4 operational routers. But in the traditional sense, they would have the flexibility to adapt and modify the details all the way up to the network layer information and pass on the information to the adjacent nodes. And in this sense, the network on the router is the end-to-end -end horizontal communication that is happening with respect to the source connecting to the router 1 and then this router connecting as the source to the destination node here on the other end. And this way, the network provides the flexibility to even scale and evolve due to this layering structure. What this also means is that these layer 2 and layer 7 devices need not have to support the entire stack and that provides a lot of flexibility in also building these networking elements that allow us to communicate from one end to the other and scale the resources quite easily. So in a nutshell, what we have tried to cover is this layering principle and the way it has evolved starting from the applications that are built on the reliable or the unreliable transport like TCP and UDP. And these transports that are built on top of the best effort or the global packet delivery model of the IP protocol. And this IP protocol is built again on top of the best effort local packet delivery or a link to link or immediate connections that either point to point or the Ethernet based communication um, protocols. And these eventually are built on top of the local physical transfer of the bits based on the connection wired or wireless medium, be it radio, Wi Fi or the copper or the fiber uh, connections that we might see. So when we look at this on the picture on the right, what we are trying to show here is exactly the way the current network stack, how it lends to a hourglass kind of a model. And you may wonder what is the significance of this hourglass model in the internet. The key here is to note that what we have assumed is that we can build several of the protocols but at the network layer, IP is the core layer that is providing the network communications. And the layers above it, in terms of the transport layer, we may have TCP, UDP, RTP and several other variants that may use the IP as their lower layer. And as you go further up, you have a lot more applications that would be supported using just these transport and the internet protocol layers, like the web, the wipe, P2P services, email, FTP, RTSP, and even the Zoom that we use, Skype services, all of those. So as you go up, it opens up and provides a lot of flexibility to add new sets of services. And likewise, when we look below the IP layer, <coughs> it is again supporting multiple lower layer protocols in a way that it abstracts out the way you want to really communicate or provide a point-to-point -point communication. <clears throat> in the sense, I could be using Ethernet, fast Ethernet. Now we think of gigabit Ethernet that we are using, or it could be the early days Sonnet kind of a communications, or the ATM communications, which were more reliable mode of communications in the early days. And we could be using a whole variants of how the communications are built. I say either using the copper fit cables, the Cat5 cables, or we could be connected to a Wi-Fi router 2.4 or the dual band gigahertz or even our typical telecommunication bands like 3G, 4G networks that we use. So in essence, we have the flexibility to interoperate or mix and match different protocols at the layers below the IP as well as for the layers that reside above the IP. And the entire stack actually becomes narrower at the IP layer. And what this really signifies is the simplicity of the IP layer or in put in another terms, it is also the lack of diversity in the protocols at the IP stack. But this simpler layer is what exactly powers the internet. That is 
if you as long as you have an IP address, be it the IPv4 or the IPv6, you are part of the network and your network then can be part of the internet or like the way we call net internet as the network of networks. Hence, this IP is seen as the powerhouse of simplicity. And in a way, this is what has led us to this robust and wide scale heterogeneous networks that can be built on the internet. And one point also to note here, like when you use your laptops or devices, you may have an Ethernet cable, you may have a Wi-Fi device. So typically nowadays what we also see is most of the devices are multi-homed. That meaning the same device may have multiple means to connect to the internet. One, it could be through the wired copper cables, through the Ethernet switch. The other, it could be through the Wi-Fi device that you, are, you may connect over a Wi-Fi uh, router all the way to the internet and nowadays the usage of these devices what we call as the multi-homed network devices has become pretty common so what this also tries to put on the other side of the requirements for the internet hosts how they should be building or what are the requirements in terms of the architectural assumptions that they bring forward in building these internet hosts and this was very nicely put forth in the rfc 1122 by Robert Braden and this encompasses a part of the architectural principles that we spoke of and the requirements or the assumptions that an end host would make in trying to make itself a part of the internet or what is the thing to think of as an open system interconnection wherein we think of internet as a network of networks and the connection is rather conceptual in terms of the way you would want to use the stack and build the communication and this also means that when we try to communicate from our end to any of the nodes, there have to be some specialized devices, which we call as the gateways. And these gateways, the role is only to ensure the connection and not anything to worry about the applications that we would be using on the end host. So the gateways need not have to keep any connection state information. Nonetheless, these gateways need to ensure the job of ensuring the right connection and forwarding the packets and route them properly and that's where their state would differ from the state that end hosts have to do and this routing complexity should be vested completely at the gateways and the end hosts need not worry about the routing and this becomes a very important principle when we try to build and onboard any of the networking hosts onto the internet imagine if you had to keep thinking about how to build the routing at your end device even before you send a packet to google it would be just impossible for all the devices to synchronize and work. But now, because the gateways take care of saying how to handle the communication and how to route the packets destined for a particular destination, the end hosts can simply trigger and use the services and rely on the gateways to work. And another aspect is like if my system goes down or let's say the Google server goes down, what happens to the entire network? And again, like we said, as networks, we try to imagine them as dumb pipes that only facilitate communication, the system must tolerate these network-wide variations of the changes in terms of reliability that can happen and in terms of any other kinds of uh, failures that would occur need to be managed by the end hosts and not necessarily rely on the networks. But the networks should in principle be also able to support or facilitate minimum information like the congestion. You looked at the ECN bits that were pushed in the IP layer and the reason for that was to ensure that the network layer where the congestion is occurring can be made to intelligently embed the information onto those packets so that they can be relayed to the end host. So in a way, the network can operate in tandem and provide necessary informations to the end hosts to act and react based on the conditions. And this is how the entire networking stack or the protocols that we see are built. And if we have to sum up the entire network protocol stack the way we have looked at and try to sum up the principal model of the ISO OSI and the practice model of the TCP IP, this is how it would look when you look at your end hosts. That is, on one end, you have the hardware of your device, which really manages or takes care of the physical layer. And on the hardware, you would have the firmwares and the device drivers that you would install implement on your operating systems 
that would partially be handling the data link layer aspects of how to frame the packets, what headers to be added, what trailers to be added before sending the packets onto the for the device, where the physical layer, the device would just send the bits of the frame and ensure the point to point communication to be right. And the layer above, that's the core or the crux are the transport and the network layer. And these are in principle built as part of the system software or what we know as the operating system or kernel in Linux. And the role of vesting the transport and network at the kernel provides the flexibility to reuse the same stack for building different applications. And on the top, what we see is the applications like web or email or FTP services, or think of any of the streaming servers that we have today that we'll be using, including this Zoom recordings that happen, the Google Meet, the Skype calls, the Netflix or Amazon Prime. So you name so many of the applications that reside, but underneath what it is allowing is to build them in the user space as specific programs. And this allows for huge customization and adaption of proprietary protocols a lot more at the application than at the transport and the network layers, which need to be somewhat open as they would be implemented by the system software. Thus, this network stack grew and we have now the internet as we see today with myriads of applications that we are hooked to for various purposes. So this all looks green, but then we are talking about the ossification. So somewhere there has to be a problem, right? So we need to uncover then where is the problem? I did hint earlier about the ossification in one way, but let's try to look in more details about what all are the aspects that led or what are all the problems with the network stack as we see today. 